And it is that time of year where we recognize those sounds of Christmas all around us. Hope your Christmas season is going well so far. Glad you're here today for a week two of Sounds of Christmas. Before I get to that, make sure you know this Saturday, big deal, lots of things happening here on campus. It's our Christmas party. Only happens once a year. It's on Saturday. It's 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., and it's awesome. If you've never been to one, let me encourage you to come. Last year, we had about 4,000 people on campus. We're expecting about that again uh, this year, so be inviting your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your family members, your pets, anyone you can talk to, invite them to come. It's going to be awesome. And then, if you want to serve, there's still some opportunities where you can come uh, help make this event happen that reaches out and serves our community. And I believe there's a card in your bulletin for you to express some interest in that. But it's going to be an awesome day. I can't wait for it. Can't wait to see you here. But I'm glad you're here today. And uh, we are taking Christmas carols that we only sing once a year. And we're looking for the message. What does it teach us about God? What does it teach us about Jesus? And then how can we apply that in our lives? And the song we just sang, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, one of my favorite Christmas songs, the one we're going to focus on Today And the first few lines of the song really capture for us kind of the theme of the entire song. So let me read them to you. You just sang them a few moments ago. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. It's the only time you ever pronounce Israel that way, but it's got to rhyme, right? So that's the way you say it that way. Ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God Appear at the end of our Divine Direction teaching series. If you missed that, they're all on our website. I attempted to go through the entire Bible and talk about how God has always involved himself in all of human history. And, and this references one of those time periods we talked about, that the people of God, the Israelites, Israel, the nation of Israel, the Jews, they are living in exile towards the end of the Old Testament, and they are in need of rescue. And yet in the middle of that, God sends them prophetic words of hope. Isaiah, he's a prophet, 700 years before Jesus is born, he gives a prophecy that there is one who will come. And so this song is referencing that, that Israel is in need of rescue and that the Son of God will eventually be the one who will come to rescue them. And of course, we now know that to be Jesus that we celebrate here at Christmas. But if I take you back to the first century and Jesus has ascended into heaven and there's this new group of people going around. They were known as the way. that They weren't called Christians until a few decades later. And, and they're telling everybody about who Jesus is. And, and there's a lot of people who are a little skeptical. And, and then there are some people who, they're Jews. They're from the nation of Israel. And they're trying to figure out, like, how does Jesus fit into all of this that all of these prophets have told us about for centuries? And so Matthew, thankfully, takes the time to pen one of our four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Matthew, appropriately, is now listed as the first book of the New Testament. I say appropriately because Matthew was the one gospel writer who went out of his way to connect the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah to the person of Jesus Christ. Matthew wanted his readers in the first century, and those of us now thousands of years later who, who read it, to recognize that the one who was prophesied about for hundreds and hundreds of years is, in fact, Jesus. And so what Matthew does at the beginning of his gospel, I'm going to read it here for you, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 23, as he takes this promise from Isaiah and he links it up with the person of Jesus. Now, this is significant. Remember, Matthew's writing this gospel a couple of decades after Jesus has ascended into heaven, and he's making sure everybody can make the connection that Jesus is who was promised, starting in verse 20. Now, he's going to tell us this through an interesting story with Joseph. But when he had considered this, who's he? He is Joseph, right? Joseph is Jesus' earthly dad. What's he considering? Well, Mary just told him that she's pregnant and the baby ain't his. He's considering, right? So he's trying to figure this out. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She'll bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then he's going to directly quote from Isaiah. That's why it's in quotation marks. Verse 23, this is Isaiah. 700 years earlier, behold, 
the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. What Matthew wants us to see is this prophesied Emmanuel is Jesus. And Jesus came specifically to save his people from their sins. So when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we are both rejoicing that God has fulfilled his promise by sending Jesus, but then also being grateful that Jesus came as the one to die for our sin. Now, I want to kind of unpack a question then for you today. And if you're taking notes, let me ask you to jot this down. It's our big idea. What does all of this mean for us now? Okay. What does God with us, Emmanuel, mean for those of us who are here today? I think it means a lot. And I'm really glad you're here today because I think that all of us need to be reminded of this. See, in the song that we just sang, Israel is in need of rescue. Ransom is the word we say in the song because of their situation. And those of us who are here today, we are still in need of rescue. And that's why Jesus came. And for many of us, Christmas is an event that happened in the past. But here's some good news. Christmas isn't just about what happened in the past. Christmas is also about the promise of the power that it provides for us today. And so maybe you're here today and you're just kind of checking things out. You haven't yet come to a place where you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You're kind of checking it out. I'm really glad you're here today. Because what I want to share with you are three things that that we have to be reminded of, that we needed to be rescued from, and it's why Jesus came at Christmas. Maybe you're here today and you've been a Christian for decades. I'm glad you're here because, see, here's what I found. The gospel is just as much a need for me today as it was the day that I gave my life to the Lord. And we have to come back to these things, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to be reminded that we, too, still need to be rescued from these things, and this is why Jesus came at the first Christmas. I'm going to share three of them with you that remind us of the promise and the power of Christmas because of God with us, Emmanuel. Number one, if you're taking notes this morning, the power and the promise of Christmas remind us that we can be rescued, rescued from effort for God. All of us are in need of rescue. From this idea that we can be good enough for God, that we can exert enough effort for God. It doesn't matter how many times we say, the, say what I'm about to say. It's so prevalent in our culture. It is so prevalent in our churches to think that our good deeds get us to heaven. I think the greatest lie that Satan, our enemy, has ever perpetuated on all of humanity is the lie that we could be good enough to get to heaven. And it's a big, big deal here in the South. It's what I kind of refer to as cultural Christianity. It's this idea that we're all Christians by culture, and, and we all just try to be a good person. And as long as we don't really do all the bad sins, and as long as we treat our neighbor as we want to be treated, and as long as we you know, kind of make sure we do some good deeds, that hopefully we get to the end of our lives, and, and the ledger, like the good things, outweigh the bad things. And then that's kind of how we are going to get to go to heaven with God for all eternity. I mean, I just heard it again this week. And someone was talking about a, a really nice thing that a couple had done, and they said, you know, there's just a special place in heaven waiting for them. Not unless they express faith in Jesus Christ. No amount of good things we do are going to earn us a special place in heaven. And, and what we have to be reminded of, church, is that there's nothing that we can bring to the table. There, there's nothing that we could do in any form of effort like if there was one step that we could take that would somehow get us closer to God, Jesus doesn't have to come at Christmas. We were helpless. We were hopeless. We were in need of rescue from this plight of trying to get to God through our good works. I love how Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8 explains this. It says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. 
Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Powerful verse. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There was nothing that we had done that brought any type of good to Jesus. While we were in the middle of our sin, Jesus died for us. See, Jesus died on the cross not so that some people who were kind of bad could finally get their act together and start doing some good deeds to become good. That is not why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross so that people who were spiritually dead could be made alive in Christ. And many of us forget that. Many of us who are actually Christ followers live a life like our own effort is what keeps us close to God. I mean, we sin, we beat ourselves up. We don't get it right, we beat ourselves up. We do something we know we shouldn't have done, we feel like God is so far away. And here's the thing. We buy into this lie that Christianity is about what you and I can do. Christianity is not about what we do. Christianity is about what Jesus has already done. And when you accept Jesus Christ into your life, you are given right standing with God. Here's what that means. There's nothing you can do that's going to push you further away from God. That when God looks at you, he sees the perfection of his son, Jesus Christ. See, it's by grace through faith that we are saved. By grace means there's nothing that we can do to earn it. It's a free gift that can only be received. And yet I think we struggle with the concept of grace. Sometimes we think we understand what grace is, but, but what we're really talking about is mercy. In fact, I have found it's helpful to define grace by taking a look at justice and mercy. So justice is when we get what we deserve. You do something bad, you get bad consequences. You do something good, you get good results. And that's kind of how we think about getting to God. Like if I just be good enough, then I'll get to God. Mercy is when we get let off the hook. You're supposed to get punished for something you did, and, and, and you don't get punished. And we think that's what Jesus did on the cross. We were supposed to die for our sin. Jesus died in our place. We receive mercy. But see, that's only part of it because it leaves out grace. So, so where does grace come in, and what does grace look like? Let me see if I can answer that by giving you an illustration from my own life. So this story that I'm about to tell you happened when I was 17 years old. How many of y'all down here are 17? All right, anybody in the room 17? Cool. Learn from this story, okay? So I'm 17 years old, and I'm running late one night, okay? My parents have said, you need to be home by a certain time. I'm driving, and I'm speeding because I'm not going to get there on time. And not only am I speeding, I run a stop sign, okay? So this is not good. That's what I'm saying. Learn from my mistakes, okay? So I run the stop sign, but to somewhat try to justify my actions before all of you so many years later. Let me kind of explain, okay? So this was a unique intersection in the town I grew up in. It, it was a three-way stop. I don't even know if they make these anymore, right? So, like, there's a road that goes this way, and, like, there's one lane of traffic, and then there's another lane of traffic, and, and then there's a road that comes out of, an, of a neighborhood. Am I, am I illustrating this well with my hands, right? So this road is coming out of the neighborhood. This road is going this way. Now, people didn't really come out of this neighborhood very much. So if you were kind of on the main road, when you got to the stop sign, you could kind of like glance into the neighborhood. And like if nobody was coming, you could kind of roll through the stop sign because the person in front of you couldn't turn in front of you. And this was just kind of a common practice. And, and this was, it was so prevalent that they actually changed the intersection because right? it just got so bad. So on this particular night, I didn't like roll through the stop sign. Like I drove through the stop sign, okay? So like I didn't even slow down. But as I was, you know, going through the stop sign, I remember looking into the neighborhood and I saw coming over the hill some headlights. And I thought to myself, I really hope that's not a cop. And all these years later, I'm telling you this story. So it must have been a cop. And it was. And he saw the whole thing happen. And so he pulls me over not too far down the road and your lights come on and I've never been pulled over by a police officer at this point in my life. I, I hate to say that's not the last time. I've been pulled over several times since then, all right? But this was the first, and so I, I'm sitting there in my car, and he walks up, and he asks for my license, and I give him the license, and he says, son, do you know why I pulled you over tonight? I said, yes, sir, it's because I ran that stop sign back there. <laughs> he kind of looks at me like, 
you're confessing your crime already. So like I uh, just kind of told on myself because I figured, yeah, we all know what happened. I'm already running late. So like I didn't say that, but like that's what I'm thinking. I got to get home. So he says, well, why'd you run the stop sign? I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm running late. I'm trying to get home. And he just cuts me off. He goes, you're going home? I said, yes, sir. He said, you're on your way to this address right now. He's looking at my driver's license. I'm like, yes, sir. He's like, are you going anywhere else before you go home? I'm like, no, sir. And he like disappears. And he goes back and he, and he goes to his police car and he sits there and, and like he's gone and I'm sitting in the car and it seemed like an eternity like he, that he was back there. It probably wasn't that long, but it felt that way to me. And like I had no way of letting my parents know. Like I don't have a cell phone. Can you imagine that? Like so we let 17-year-olds drive around in vehicles without cell phones. I mean, we're the 90s, the dark ages. I mean, come on, right? Like that's what we did. So I have no way of letting them know that I'm going to be now even later. And he's back there for what seems like forever. And he finally comes back up and he gives me my license and he says, all right, I want you to drive directly home. Do you understand? I'm like, yes, sir. And then I said something really stupid to a police officer. All right, so don't ever say this to a police officer. I looked at him, and I said, don't I get a ticket? Like, I, like it was a gift or something, right? And he just like shook his head, like, what's wrong with this kid? And he's like, no, you need to go home. So I'm like, all right, thank you. Yes, sir. So I start driving. And now I'm trying to like process like what just happened. So I got about 10 minutes before I get home, and I'm trying to figure out what just happened? And I, and I don't have like a good motivation for trying to figure out what happened. I'm trying to figure out what happened because I'm trying to decide whether or not I have to tell my parents what just happened, okay? That's it. Because the best I can tell, they don't know what happened. None of their friends drove by and saw this. So like I'm thinking, I'm in the clear. Like this can be my little secret that I'll tell them one day, like when I'm an adult at a family reunion. So I'm like, there's no reason for them to know. But the thing that kept popping up in my head was like, why did he ask me three times if I was on my way home? See, I don't know the drill. I don't know how this works. I don't know at this, I don't know, like, did he go back and call my parents? Like, do police officers do that? Like, my phone number's not on my driver's license. And, but like, I, I'm trying to figure all this out. And in the middle of all of this, like, figuring stuff out, it hits me, wait a second. There's a bunch of people at my house. And this is helpful. My sister, who's a year younger than me, had a bunch of friends over that night. And this was not uncommon. We both played basketball, we had a big youth group, and we always had people over at our house. Our parents wanted our house to be the place where everybody hung out, and we're all night owls, and so it was not uncommon to have a bunch of people at our house eating, hanging out, playing ping pong, having a great time, right? So I remembered there's going to be a lot of people at my house, and this was helpful because here's what I knew. If I got home and I walked in the house and everybody's eating and everybody's having a good time, then my parents don't know because if a police officer had really called my house and told my dad what I did, I know my dad. I know what he would have done. He'd have got off the phone and he'd have told everybody, y'all need to go to the basement because when Adam gets home, we got to take care of some business. All right, that's probably how that would have gone. And now I'm going to go home into a quiet house and man, I'm going to get in trouble. Dad's going to, you know, he's going to do some things. So like I kind of knew that's what would happen. So I get home, I walk in the house and it's like a party. I had people everywhere, loud, having a good time, having fun. And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Like it's had that feeling, right? And right about the time I was going to like really savor that feeling, this little voice in my head just kind of started, you know, saying, you need to tell them. You ever had that little voice in your head? So I've learned over the years, because I haven't always listened to that little voice. So I've learned over the years, it's better to tell on yourself and go ahead and deal with the consequences than to try to cover up what you did, and then the consequences are going to be much worse. And so thankfully, on this particular evening, I decided to listen to that little voice. So I'd only been home for about five minutes, and I went up to my dad, and I said, hey, can I ask you a really random question? <laughs> he said, sure. I go, did a police officer call here about 15 minutes ago? He said, yes, he did. I said, would you like to know why? He said, yeah. I said, well, I ran a stop sign trying to get home. He goes, yeah, that's exactly what he told me. And then he goes, all right, Chad, you can come out of your room now. I'm, I'm living in bizarro world. Like, I don't know what is going on. He's yelling at my brother to come out of his room. I forget, I got a younger brother named Chad, and, and like, I'm not getting in trouble, and everybody's still eating. And like, I think my mom just felt sorry for me, so she finally was like, let me tell you what happened. All right, here's what happened. She said, the police officer calls the house, and we all got really scared because that's like the last thing you want is a, a call from a police officer when you have teenagers. So once your dad realized, you know, you were okay, like we were all kind of relieved, and, and the officer told, you know, dad what you did. So when he got off the phone, he announced to everybody in our home what you had done, okay? And he told them that we were going to have fun with this and see what you would do, that if you came home and you told us the truth, then nothing would happen. But if you came home and you didn't tell us, he was going to ground you and take away your car for a month. 
And then he sent Chad to his room because he knew that as Chad's older brother, you are his ride, and Chad would tell you to tell him. So I was like, oh, all right. And that's why Chad got sequestered. So like it all started to make sense. Now, what happened that night? I should have received justice. Justice would have been a ticket. Justice would probably have been getting grounded and losing my car for being so irresponsible. Instead, I received mercy. The police officer let me off the hook. My dad let me off the hook. But this story does not communicate grace. And see, for Christians so many times, like, that's kind of the extent of where we stop. It's like, well, we should have been punished for our sin. Like, we're grateful Jesus took our place. But we don't quite know how to comprehend grace, or what does that even mean? So let's go back to my story, and, and let's just imagine for a moment that grace had entered the picture as well. Now, none of this that I'm about to tell you happened, okay? But just, just imagine, just to illustrate grace, that after all of this, that same night, my parents had said, and you know, Adam, we spent some time in prayer, and, and here's what we've decided. That 1986 red two-door blazer you're driving, that's just not good enough for you. So we're gonna take you tomorrow morning to the dealership in town and you can pick out whatever car you want on the lot. You want a truck, you want an SUV, you want a sports car. We just don't really feel like that you have a good enough car to continue to run these stop signs. Like, what if they had said that? You'd be like, that's crazy. Like, that's terrible parenting. But yet, that would have been grace because see, here's what grace is. Grace is when we get something that we don't deserve. And for many Christians, we've never stopped to consider just how gracious God has been to us. See, not only did Jesus take our place on the cross, when we accept him as our Savior, we also receive his righteousness, his perfection. Here's what that means. No amount of sin for the believer can create distance between you and God. Here's what that means. Like, you continue to be rewarded for your bad behavior. And so many Christians beat themselves up over their bad behavior instead of rejoicing that God's already beaten up his own son on the cross over your bad behavior that the Bible calls sin. See, that's grace. See, grace says not only do you get to experience salvation, Jesus says you get to have an abundant life. Grace says, not only do you get to experience salvation, I'm going to give you the presence of the Holy Spirit, which John says leads us into all truth. See, we, we may get to experience salvation, but grace says, guess what? There's also the promise of heaven, so you don't have to fear death. And for so many of us, we approach our Christian life like it all depends on us. And maybe this Christmas season, we could be rescued from our effort, because that's why Jesus came, that we rest in God's grace. The Bible says, be still and know that I am God. It's powerful, and we have to be reminded of it. Let me tell you the second thing that the power of Christmas reminds us of. We can be rescued from performance, performance for others. We're in need of rescue. Rescue from our effort for God. Rescue from our performance for others. All of us seek validation from others. Sometimes we seek that validation from people who are close to us. Our spouse, our kids, our parents, our family members, people in our church. Sometimes we seek that validation from people we don't even know. But at all times, there's this longing inside of us that we would be accepted, that we would win approval, that people would, would like us and maybe even want to be like us. I mean, very few people get up every morning and just put on clothes and go about their day. Most people, when they put on clothes, they're hoping that someone will notice and maybe even offer a compliment. And, and if the day goes by and there's never a compliment that comes, there's like this ache that just kind of starts to build internally. And see, this desire to be validated by others is, is worse now because we have a scorecard. It's an ever-present scorecard. 
through social media. And I like social media. I'm pretty active on social media. But we all have to be careful because, see, social media can perpetuate this. So, like, you're on social media and you post something that's kind of fun and maybe you get, like, three likes. And then later on in the day, you notice that one of your friends posted something and they got 300 likes. And they've been validated now 100 times more than you. And all it does is continue to contribute to this ache. And the reason why it's a performance is because when we seek validation from others, all of our life feels like a constant performance. It feels like we're always trying to win the approval of someone else. And some of us are good at it. I mean, depending on who we're around and depending on what conversation we're having, we can shift and we can adjust and we can become what we need to become in order to get the validation from someone else in the moment. And we live in a world that has a top 100 beautiful list and a top 100 successful list and a top 100 under 30 list. And all of our life is designed, culturally speaking, to get us to compare ourselves to one another, seek validation from one another, and therefore perform through our lives to get that. Here's the word for that. Exhausting. Exhausting. And it's having devastating consequences. We have never as a people dealt with greater levels of anxiety than we are right now. Now, I'm not smart enough to give you all the reasons, but I can tell you what I'm talking about right now is one of the main reasons. God didn't create us to live that way. And it's unhealthy at a soul level and it creates anxiety and we don't know what to do with it. I even read something this week, it just devastated me that that the average teenager, and if you're not around teenagers very much, I need you to listen to what I'm about to say, because this is the world that they are in. This was not the case for me, students, when I was a teenager 20 years ago, okay? But the average teenager today has higher levels of anxiety than patients who were in psych wards in the 1950s. Why? Approval. Acceptance. Desiring it living a life of performance, and we need to be rescued from that. You know, I don't know who needs to hear this today, but there was just a weight on me all week preparing the sermon. I just felt like the Lord spoke and said, you need to tell someone this. I don't know who this is for. Maybe you're sitting in here. Maybe you're watching online, but I believe that the Lord told me this week that somebody was going to be here today who's considering ending their life. And so I don't know who this is for, but if that's you, I need you to listen to me. You have value. You have worth. You matter because of an intrinsic value, a value that has nothing to do with what anyone else says, a value that you don't have to earn through performance, a value that comes directly from God, your heavenly Father, because he created you in his image. And there's a really powerful passage from the Bible that I hope helps you see what a gift you've been given with life. Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you created my inmost being. being. We're talking to God here. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. It's a powerful verse. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. See, you have value. So how do I know that's true? Christmas is how God proved to you how valuable you are. Christmas is how God proved to you how valuable you are. That he wasn't going to leave you distant from himself. He created you. He loves you. He has a plan for you. He knew you before you were you. And Christmas is how he proves your value, that if you were the only person who had ever walked the face of the earth, Christmas would still have happened. Why? Because you're valued. Not from anything that you've ever done, not from any type of acceptance that you seek from others, but because God says you have value. We are valued simply for who we are, not the things that we do through performance to gain acceptance from others. Christmas is how God proves how valuable you are. Do not forget you have incredible value and worth 
to God. Let me give you the third thing that the power and the promise of Christmas reminds us of. We can be rescued from loneliness. Loneliness from, and then I left a blank, for everybody to just kind of ponder what causes your loneliness. See, what I have discovered is that everybody understands what it feels like to be lonely, but most of us have different reasons or different emotions that contribute to our loneliness. And I want you to think about it. Like, what, what fuels your loneliness? Like, sometimes people are lonely, and I just tried to come up with a list this week. From being misunderstood, you feel like people misunderstand you, it leads you to feeling lonely. Sometimes people feel lonely because something's happened to them, maybe traumatic. Sometimes people feel lonely because they have were betrayed by someone who was close to them. Sometimes people feel lonely because they've been abandoned. Sometimes people feel lonely because of their own mistakes or failures that ended a relationship. Sometimes people feel lonely because they've experienced the death of someone close. See, we all can say yes, we understand with loneliness, but I'm pushing you this morning to get past that and, and, and consider what's the emotion behind your loneliness. Because until you identify the emotion behind the loneliness, you're never going to understand the power of Christmas. But you see, the power of Christmas shows us that even if no one else in this life understands where you're at, Jesus does. One of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture to help us see this is found in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You see what that verse says? Jesus has empathy. Empathy. And, and I have found that sometimes we use sympathy and empathy synonymously, but they're different words. They're both helpful, but they're different. Sympathy is when, like, you tell me something bad you're going through, and I'm like, man, I, I feel really terrible for you. Like, I mean, it, it, it's, it's heartfelt, it's loving, but I don't fully understand it because I hadn't walked through that. Empathy is when someone looks at you and says, I feel for you, because I know exactly how that feels, because I've gone through the exact same thing myself. And we all know the power of empathy when it comes from someone else. What this passage is saying is that Jesus, who came at Christmas, has empathy. Whatever it is that you are going through this morning, Jesus says, I know exactly what that feels like. I have walked through that, you say, I feel loneliness because I feel misunderstood. Jesus knows what it's like to be misunderstood. That the people he came to die for were the people who were calling for his crucifixion. See, he said, I feel lonely because I feel betrayed by someone close. Jesus knows what it feels like to be betrayed. Jesus knows what it feels like to be abandoned. Everyone close to him abandoned him on his night of arrest. Jesus knows what it's like. This one really takes a moment, but Jesus knows what it's like to have a distant relationship with a parent. So wait a second, hold on. God is Jesus' father. How could you possibly say that? Well, on the cross, Jesus cried out, my father, why have you forsaken me? Now, the reason why God had to forsake Jesus is because God can't have anything to do with sin, and Jesus became sin. 2 Corinthians says, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I, 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 I don't know if he can understand the dynamic I have between my parents. He said, I don't know if he could understand my past. Do you, do you realize that for all of Jesus' life, he had to overcome the stigma of the way he was born? Do you realize that a foundational part of our faith is an unplanned pregnancy? And you realize that people were people back then just like they are now, and the gossip that Jesus had to endure his entire life about where he came from and his upbringing and all the rumors of Mary and Joseph. You say, the point I'm trying to make 
is that all of God's word is true. And when we are told we have a great high priest who can empathize with us, here's where the power comes. The end of the passage says, so that we can approach God's throne with confidence. Here's what that means. You can tell Jesus anything because he's been through it. And the power of Christmas is because Jesus came into this world, we don't have to go through this world alone. He's always with us. He's always there, empathizing with everything we experience. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? See, some of you are here today, and you bought into the lie that there were good enough things you could do to be a Christian. You may have called yourself a Christian your whole life, but you've never come to a place in your life where you've admitted you're a sinner in need of a Savior. And I want to challenge you right now where you're seated to just pray, Jesus, I admit I need you that my good works are not going to be good enough. I believe you died on the cross in my place. I believe you defeated death through the resurrection. I want to ask you to come into my life and save me this morning. Some of you are here and you have been wearing yourself out trying to seek the approval and the validation from others. And maybe this morning you could come back to God, your creator, who says you have worth because of who you are and receive that. Some of you are here this morning, you're walking through a tough season and Christmas just makes it worse. And you need to grab on to the fact that the person we celebrate at Christmas is the person who can walk with you through this because he empathizes with you today. So Jesus, we're grateful. We're grateful for who you are. We're grateful that you came after us. We're grateful that you sacrificed yourself. We're grateful that you defeated death through the resurrection. And we're grateful that you're here right now empathizing with where we are, understanding the level of anxiety that so many of us deal with. Lord, we need to be freed up from the amount of effort that we continue to exert, thinking that somehow will earn us what you've already given us freely. So Lord, as we worship you right now, free us. Come alongside us. Be near. Remind us. Encourage us. We need to experience you this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, let me invite you to stand. As you do, our team's gonna lead us in a time of response.